herzlich willkommen. Wir ähm, starten jetzt und die gute Nachricht ist, ähm, wir reden ja über das, ähm, das Buch ähm, Keine halben Sachen, No Shortcuts auf Englisch und das Gute ist, die Autorin ist hier ähm, und die schlechte Nachricht ist, ähm, die Bücher sind für den Moment ähm, leider vergriffen. Das heißt, ähm, die sind so gut ähm, weggegangen, dass jetzt im Moment leider keine Ausgaben hier sind, aber sie sind natürlich im Handel erhältlich. Also das äh, tut uns leid, aber das ähm, ist jetzt leider im Moment so. Und ähm, genau, also ich bin ähm, Sarah Nagel, ich arbeite im Bereich Strategie und Grundsatzfragen ähm, in der Bundesgeschäftsstelle der Linken und ich bin auch aktiv in der Linken Neukölln wo wir versuchen, ähm, organisierende Ansätze auch auszuprobieren. Ähm, deswegen sozusagen nähere ich mich diesem Thema sozusagen von, von zwei Seiten. Und ähm, das ist ähm, Jane McAlevey, die ähm, Organiserin, Autorin und Wissenschaftlerin ist, ähm, hat jetzt gerade ihr, ähm, also ihr zweites Buch, ähm, No Shortcuts, ist ähm, jetzt gerade ins Deutsche übersetzt worden und gerade erschienen. Und ihr erstes ähm, Buch, ähm, Raising Expectations, Raising Hell, ist 2012 ähm, bereits erschienen und äh, sie kann zurückblicken auf ganz viel Erfahrung, zuerst im Community Organizing und in der Klimabewegung und ähm, später in der gewerkschaftlichen Organisierung. Und ähm, genau, ich freue mich ähm, ganz besonders, dass sie heute hier ist. Genau, und wir ähm, werden so etwa ähm, eine Dreiviertelstunde ähm, uns hier unterhalten und dann ist auch Zeit für, ähm, für eure Fragen und, und Anmerkungen, dass wir dann in die Diskussion ähm, starten und ähm, für euch ist es natürlich wie ähm, für uns, ihr könnt euch dann einfach aussuchen, in welcher Sprache ihr euch besser fühlt. Ähm, und ähm, meine erste Frage an dich, Jane, ist... Ähm, Einfach, also das Buch heißt ja No Shortcuts, also auf Deutsch heißt es keine halben Sachen, Machtaufbau durch Organizing, aber warum hast du dich für diesen Titel entschieden? Um, hello. Hello. I'll try again. Hello. Oh, that's better. Hello. Okay, good. Hi. Um, first I want to thank uh, Sarah uh, for agreeing to sit with me this evening. Um, and of course, Jan Peter, um, who's translating, and every person around who did something um, for today's event. Thank you all um, very much, and it's very nice to see all of you. So, uh, the title, No Shortcuts, or No, no Half Things, I think in German, right? Yeah. So, No Half Things. Um, to me, uh, I think a lot of what has been happening in the last... 20 years or so, um, 25 years, uh, in my experience in the trade union sector, but not just the trade union sector, but definitely in the trade union sector, is that 25 or 30 years ago, there was some idea inside of the trade union sector, inside of the United States, that we were going to organize again, we were going to rebuild unions, we were going to make it all good. Um, all over again, and that happened in 1996, put a specific date on it, it was 1996, when um, a group of different officials, officials from the service sector unions, sort of won control of the National Labor Federation uh, in the United States, and they, they won on a promise of rebuilding trade unions through organizing, and there was a lot of talk about organizing, and then a lot of talk about organizing, and People use the word organizing a lot. Um, and as I began my full-time work, I think for the first few years, I think the first few years, we were actually trying to do real organizing um, in a fair number of the unions. And then very, very, very quickly, almost without people noticing, even to this day, uh, people actually stopped the little bit of organizing that they were trying to do. Organizing by which I mean organizing, which we'll get to. Um, and they began to take um, shortcuts. Um, they began to take what they thought were quicker um, and easier, but they thought quicker ways to get the employers, to get the bosses in the United States um, to stop fighting. A theory emerged that, you know, this is really hard, this organizing thing, and if we would just be nicer to the employers, and put a little pressure on them. We would put a lot of money into political campaigns at the top, and we would use political pressure 
to put pressure on the employers to get them to fight the workers less. And then we thought about this thing called capital strategies. Oh yeah, we have a lot of money in the union pension funds and we can use pension funds to put pressure on the companies to make the companies fight the workers less. And a whole theory evolved that no one ever really talked about, which was about shortcuts and about walking away from spending a lot of time with workers and trying to use media, then social media, and narrative change, and investment capital, and politics to replace workers um, as the lead agents in the organizing process, in the process of actually themselves making change in their own lives. Um, and I think that me asserting uh, on the title of a book, No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power, um, was to indicate two things. For me, the book was sort of like calling the question, if that translates well, like I was calling the question, like, hey, we're not even organizing anymore. If we did it, it was for a little while. Most unions stopped doing it fairly quickly and began to do what I called mobilizing, right? Um, and mobilizing meant it looked like organizing because you brought some workers, like workers came, called a protest, called a meeting, you let the workers come. But it wasn't actually focused on building worker power, so that's the second part of the title. Um, the putting the words organizing for power on the cover of the book was actually very important to me. So it was to say, if we want to build power, which is what workers need, both in Germany and in the United States and everywhere, we have to focus on building power. We cannot take short routes to build power because there's only one way to build power, really, the kind of, this kind of power. 100% all-out strike power. So um, I think the, the, the book title summarizes really the thesis of the book, um, which is that people said they were doing organizing and they actually weren't doing organizing. Um, and they stopped focusing on building power and they started to focus mostly on, you know, tweeting and social media and having rallies, um, but not actually focusing on how is it that we enable hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of workers to regain control of their lives with them at the center of the fight. Um, thank you. Um, danke. <laughs> um, da, also du hast gesagt, also Leute haben viel über um, Organizing geredet. Das, um, das kenne ich auch. Um, also ich mache das, mach das auch. <laughs> Aber sozusagen das, worüber du um, auch schreibst um, und um, wie du arbeitest, das um, nennst du, um, um, das nennst du um, Deep Organizing. Um, und um, vielleicht könntest du noch kurz erläutern, was da sozusagen der, um, das Besondere dran ist, also so zwischen Organizing und um, was eigentlich die Bedeutung von Deep Organizing ist. Ja, yeah. yeah, so, um, when I, so, when I, um, when I was writing about organizing versus mobilizing, I think there are several things that distinguish the concepts um, the first is that the workers themselves have to do it. Um, the worker, in the case of a workplace campaign, it's actually the workers themselves who have to do the work, not other agents of change. Um, secondly, um, when we're organizing, we are waking up in the morning focused on the workers who are not coming to our meetings or who are not yet involved in our work or who may not even believe in the union at all, um, which is probably why they're not coming to our meetings. So um, for me, organizing is about how do you build in any workplace to 100% participation? When you wake up in the morning and you make your work plan for the day, at the end of the goal of every day, does your work plan say, what are we doing today to build towards 100% worker participation into everything we're doing. And it doesn't mean 100% participation all at once or all at the same time, except if we're on strike. Then we need 100% participation all at once. Um, but what really distinguishes the two are that in the mobilizing model, which is what people confuse as organizing, we constantly spend all of our time talking to the same people. We're functionally talking to ourselves. Um, 
We might have a rally. We might have a meeting. It might even have a good turnout. We might even have a few thousand people on the streets. We might have 10,000 people on the streets. We might have 500 people at a meeting. But if we don't know who those people are or how they got there, or if there's hundreds of thousands more that could have been there or should have been there and that aren't there, then that's mobilizing. And organizing is a systematic method to maximize participation by the immediately affected constituency, in this case, um, workers. But it would be true, if we were talking about housing organizing too, then we'd want to have 100% of all the tenants in a particular housing unit. Um, so, that's, so, the, so the core distinctions are really, do we wake up in the morning trying to get every single person involved? Or are we satisfied or happy if you know a bunch of people come to a meeting and it looks good and it feels good and we tweet a nice photo and it looks great on the Twitter page or Facebook, um, but it actually isn't building any power, um, which is what happens uh, a lot, I think. Und ähm, in, dem, in deinem Buch ähm, schreibst du ähm, auch aus den Erfahrungen darüber, dass das ähm, in Kämpfen wichtig ist, ähm, sogenannte Organic Leaders ähm, zu finden, also herauszufinden, wer das ist. Und ähm, vielleicht kannst du darüber noch ähm, kurz was erzählen und vielleicht auch sozusagen aus, ähm, aus Streikerfahrungen ähm, berichten, die dir besonders im Gedächtnis geblieben sind, also die du besonders beeindruckend fandst. Yes, great. Another of my favorite questions. <laughs> so the organic leader, um, which I certainly do write and talk a lot about. Um, so uh, I think for, I would not just, not just for me, but for us. So I should clarify that I come from a long line um, of organizers. I come from a long line um, of very smart people who taught me most of everything I know. Um, I did not wake up in the morning and create these theories, uh, but I've spent 25 years or more now doing them. So, um, so my mentors taught me years ago that there was something called um, a real leader, an informal leader. Um, and the leaders are in the workplace before any union shows up. The leaders are actually there long before any activist shows up. And those are the leaders that we're looking for, which is what we call the organic leaders. So in any workplace, in any structured environment, um, any workplace, any tenant complex, any school, any place where people come together repeatedly, and so I'm just going to stick mostly to workplaces, in any workplace, there, there are a set of workers who have the respect of their coworkers, and they carry a kind of informal leadership. And they don't learn it because somebody teaches it to them. Um, the characteristics of the organic leader are, generally speaking, they're very good workers. Like they're really good at their job, whatever their job is. And so that means that coworkers, their workers, their coworkers, will turn to them uh, for help on the job. Like if they don't know how to do something, a procedure or a something, um, people will come to them and say, hey, you know, the boss just asked me if I'm a nurse, the boss just asked me to do this procedure. Um, and left without helping me, and I'm a little bit nervous about that. Can you help me actually figure out how to do the procedure? Um, the person that everyone is turning to and going to for things like assistance when they're trying to figure it out, or if they're a teacher, it's the teacher um, who's been in the school for a long time, and a new teacher uh, on the scene isn't getting something about the curriculum very well, and they'll go to a very good teacher and say, how do I do this? And the key is, there are definitely some workers who are very good at work, but who don't make any time to help anyone else. Okay, we're not talking about them. So these workers have to be, generally speaking, very good at their job and solidaristic by nature. They're caring. They'll actually make time. So if someone comes to ask them for help, they will absolutely, even though they have no time either, um, they will absolutely make the time to help a worker who's trying to do their job better. Um, those are some of the characteristics of the organic leader. Um, and importantly also, I should say, if there's a smart manager, if there's a smart boss, um, the smart boss usually knows who the organic leaders are too. And I would argue usually more so um, or earlier than the union does. Because a smart manager is already observing who's very good and who are the workers going to. And if they're a really smart manager, they're sort of informally using that person um, to help them get things carried out as well in the workplace. 
So that's why I think a lot of union organizers get confused by them because they're typically not involved in the union. They have a lot of power already. They can get a lot of things done, quote unquote, without the help of a union. They're essentially workers who oftentimes function a bit like um, a union without being in the union. And so they're, they're tricky to recruit. They're harder for um, us to identify, well they're not hard to identify, but they're, hard to, they're often harder to recruit. So we might identify them, and there's a series of methods and mechanisms that we use to help identify them. Um, we might identify them, but then there's often the hard work of persuading them um, that joining up with the trade union is what makes most sense. And that's a different process. But finding them first is most important. And there's a series, there's a page in the book um, called Advice for Rookie Organizers, somewhere in the middle of the, the German version of the book, um, where I lay out the principles um, of organizing as I was taught them. And those principles are worth the whole book, in my opinion. Um, they were all handed down to me. And somewhere in there we say, um, uh, you know, the workers already have chosen their leaders. Our job is to find them. Uh, we, don't, we don't magically create a leader. They're there. Their coworkers pick them. Our job is to find them. So I can either stop there or I can try and explain it and show some examples. Talk about Marne. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, talk about Marne. So um, I think because this concept matters so much, uh, we brought a few slides. I'm not going to show many slides, um, but I think this one concept lends itself to um, a couple of images. So I'm going to just occasionally show you images, and but we're not really spend a lot of time up there. But to understand a little bit uh, a story from a recent really big campaign um, about organic leaders, I'm just going to show you a few slides. There we go. Anyone who's seen me any time in the last 10 days has probably seen this slide already. Um, because I love to show it, this and a few others. So this is what we call a wall chart, a big wall chart. Um, and big wall charting, um, if I had a religion, it would be this. Um, or the religion would be organizing and this would be my Bible. Um, so it is like sort of like a, 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 an article of faith for me are these documents. So to figure out who the organic leaders are, we do something called big wall charting. And they can be as big as this, but they're usually about a fourth of the size um, of what's behind me. So they're big. And the idea is that they're big so that all the workers in the campaign can actually see them um, and have discussions about them. And uh, we use them, okay, so let me just explain this one. This is the Surgical Intensive Care Unit, S-I-C-U. It's one unit in a big hospital. Um, and if we're in an organizing campaign or a tough contract campaign or building for a strike, um, since we're trying to get 100% participation and we're trying to figure out who the or informal or organic leaders are, we start by doing a wall chart. And on the wall chart, move slowly, on the wall chart, um, we're doing a few things. We're starting by putting every single worker's name from this unit on the chart. And there's two shifts in a hospital in the United States. So there's the day shift and there's the night shift. And it's very important that we do this in handwriting. Um, and there, there's many reasons why we use these charts. But one reason that we use them and we do handwriting um, is because we're actually teaching the workers themselves how to do this. Um, and if we rely on computer databases and computer spreadsheets and computer printouts, we're not actually making it accessible for ordinary workers to do this work. So there's, there's a lot of principles behind why we use big and handwritten and magic markers and things that are very easy for any worker almost to get their hands on because we're teaching the workers to do this. The workers themselves are doing this. So, um, so we put all the names on a chart and then we begin to put some kind of symbol next to their name if they are participating in something we call a structure test, which we'll get to. Um, so a structure test just means something that the workers are being asked to do in the campaign. By each other, they vote, let's do this. So the blue dot here means that all these workers have signed an authorization card to form a union. The green dot means they're going to vote yes on a petition. That's a very specific petition. Um, the orange or the reddish dot means 
um, that they signed another petition saying that they want their boss to get to negotiations because the boss was refusing to negotiate. Um, the yellow one means they filled in a contract survey and so on and on and on. There's lots of them. But each, si each symbol up there, each color and symbol, is a way for us to assess how many workers in that unit are participating in the exercise. So that's one unit. And I'm going to show you this is labor and delivery. So that's a second unit in the same hospital. Um, and it looks a little less good, right? It's a little messier. There's a little less participation. There's some less workers involved. And that means that we either don't have the right organic leader, or in this case, we have them, but they're not fully functioning in the campaign. They're not really taking full leadership yet. And then this next one is going to make the point. So what's happening in that picture, in that unit? Anyone? How does that compare? Nothing. There's nothing happening in that unit. So that's at the same time as the other units. So this is a very big unit called telemetry in the same hospital at the same time. So another reason we use this method is because it should be very obvious to you just looking at it in a second that we have a big problem in this unit, which is we don't have the organic leader. We do not, we have not recruited the organic leader because there is basically nothing happening in this unit. We have one person named Liz Miller, right there, Liz Miller, Elizabeth Miller, but it's Liz Miller in real life. Um, and Liz, you know, Liz, nickname, Liz has done three things. She's participated in three activities of the whole unit. And the best anyone else has done, the best any other worker has participated was either in the initial authorization card, and maybe they signed um, what we call the contract survey, where they're filling in what they want in the contract. That's it. And the simple reason why this is a crisis in a big campaign is because we do not have the organic leader in this unit. Not only do we not have the organic leader, but there's an organic leader of the workers in this unit who is running the anti-union campaign. She's actually running the campaign to kill the workers' union. Um, and her name uh, is Marnay Payne. She's right there. I'm only telling you this story because she's in the third book. The book I just finished, I'm going to tell this whole story. Um, and Marnay is very involved in me telling the story. And so is Liz Miller. Um, so Liz is what we call an activist. She's gung-ho for the union. She comes to every meeting. She loves the union. She wants the union. She volunteers. She shows up. She can't get a, basically, once Marnay said no one's doing anything to any other worker in there, the whole place was shut down, just shut down. Uh, Liz Miller could never contend, compete with Marnay Payne for leadership in the unit. Um, it's not possible. So Liz is an activist, and Marnay is the organic leader, and Marnay's in charge, and she's there long before us, and she's running an anti-union campaign. The good news is, she finally decides to change her opinion. Yay! Um, and in one uh, hour, she does this. So this yellow means that they've all now decided to join the union. And when Marnay decided to join the union, every single person at work decided to join the union. And by the way, she got 100% of every single worker in the workplace. She got the day shift. She stayed around for about 20 minutes and got everyone coming on the night shift. And if you know about shift work in hospitals, the only reason it didn't go completely to yellow is because not every worker is there every day. By the end of the week, every single worker in this unit had yellow over their name. So that's what one organic worker leader can do. They can actually control the entire workplace. And it wasn't until we identified Marnay and then recruited her that the entire campaign began to shift. So we have to do that unit by unit, shift by shift, facility by facility, in order to build to, um, in our country, uh, in order to build to that, or that. In order to build to a 100% out strike, we have to find the organic leaders, we have to be patient and recruit them um, to the cause, and then we have mass participation. Um, so she was, key was she was anti-union for a very long time until she decided she was on the wrong side. Um, 
Genau, also ich ähm, war ähm, auch unter den äh, Leuten, die in den letzten zehn Tagen ähm, dir schon zuhören durften. Deswegen ähm, genau kannte ich äh, die Geschichte auch schon und fand, äh, fand es aber sehr ähm, beeindruckend. Ähm, und ähm, du meintest auch, dass ihr immer versucht, ähm, 100 Prozent der, ähm, der Beschäftigten ähm, äh, hinter euch zu bekommen, sozusagen zu organisieren und äh, einfach, weil ihr gewinnen wollt, also weil das sozusagen ähm, der wahrscheinlichste Weg ist, um tatsächlich dann am Ende zu gewinnen. Und ähm, genau, wir hatten uns schon, schon kurz vorher unterhalten und ähm, da hatte ich auch äh, erzählt, dass das sozusagen, obwohl ich seit ungefähr 15 Jahren politisch aktiv bin, ähm, nicht so oft sozusagen irgendwie der Fokus war in den ersten Jahren. Also da bin ich immer sozusagen zu meinen Treffen hingegangen und ähm, und wollte deswegen auch ein bisschen darüber reden, ähm, was eigentlich ähm, or organisieren ähm, im politischen Kontext auch ähm, bedeuten kann. Ähm, und im Vorwort von der englischen Ausgabe des Buches ähm, schreibst du auch ein bisschen was ähm, über Trump, sozusagen, ähm, der jetzt 2016 äh, die Präsidentschaftswahl gewonnen hat. Und ähm, das fand ich auch ähm, interessant, weil du geschrieben hast, ähm, sozusagen, dass ähm, in, gerade im politischen Kontext vieles von Meinungsforschern beeinflusst wird, ähm, also dass sie halt eine große Rolle spielen und dass sozusagen so Narrativentwicklungen, äh, Messaging, Botschaften eine immer größere Rolle spielen spielen und ähm, du hast dann ähm, geschrieben, also anstatt jetzt einen oberflächlichen äh, Plan für ähm, 2020 zu machen, bräuchte, bräuchte es eigentlich äh, einen Plan für 2040 und ähm, das fand ich, ähm, äh, ja, fand ich auch interessant und ähm, genau wollte dich fragen, was das sozusagen für dich bedeutet, also wie müsste sich, äh, müsste sozusagen Organizing aussehen, wenn man was ähm, der Rechten auch entgegensetzen möchte. Um, thank you. Um, how would it look? Yeah. So it's true. Um, uh, there was a there was a there was a, sub, a later version of the book that came out recently, a reissue of the No Shortcuts, just because they ran out. So we added a new preview. I mean, in that preview, I got to reflect on Trump's victory because the book came out just the first version came out just before Trump. So um, I talk about having a 2040 plan for so many reasons. First, um, in the United States, and I talk about this in the book, right, the, the far right in 1970, we've pinpointed it to about 1973. There were a series of meetings in the United States in 1973 where the right, corporations and the right, I mean, cultural right and corporate right, they came together in the early 1970s on the heels of great changes that happened in the US, right? Civil rights movement, right to vote for blacks, women's movement, environmental change, trade unions had already, workers fighting in their trade unions had made many things better, eight hour work day, pension funds, retirement, healthcare. Um, then the environmental movement came along in 1970 in the US and started to win the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And so a whole lot of victories were happening in the US. People, ordinary people were winning a lot of change. And in the early 70s, the right wing said, enough. And they built um, what they thought was gonna be a 30 to 40 year plan to totally re retake control of the United States of America. And guess what? They just did it, right? <laughs> they really did it. So they made a long-term plan. They understood that they couldn't, not that we didn't have Twitter, thank God, or whatever, in 1973, but it doesn't matter. They used whatever, whatever mechanisms were available. Nobody who was serious about re-seizing con total control of the country, no one would have thought they could do it next year. None of them thought they could do it in two years. None of the right, the corporate right and the right, they, came, they formed a new organization called the Business Roundtable, um, which began to work in tandem with the US Chamber of Commerce. Like, there was a whole series of organizations that were literally established um, to do this work. Like I'm putting him back into the microphone. Um, so there were a whole series of organizations that were uh, established to make a long-term plan to politically take control of the country. And they created what's called war rooms. Like what's a war room? Like they had a strategy room. And they began to figure out 
what issues will divide the working class? How can we divide the working class? Um, how can we divide women? How can we divide black people? How can we sow division among the base? Um, how can we begin to build alternative organizations that we can begin to peel some of the people away from the trade unions and the social movement organizations that were sort of at the height of their power in the late 60s and early 70s in the US. Um, and so they needed a very long-term plan to do it. So I always felt like when I was a young organizer and I began to see those documents, I, I thought, right, to do anything meaningful takes some time. It actually just takes some time. Um, and we have to be a little bit more patient than we know how to be in general. Um, not that there aren't urgent crises, like, hello, planet's blowing up. I'm very well aware of it, right? But it doesn't, just because the planet is really in big trouble, it doesn't mean that we can quickly flick on Facebook and fix the problem. It's not gonna happen that way. So what we need to actually win is power. And the whole point of my second book is to say you can't just make power happen um, in one year. It's gonna take some time, and it has to be methodical. And I don't think we have to wait till 2040, I don't. But the idea of saying we need a 2040 plan, it's not a bad thing to say in terms of just getting people to focus on the right wing took 45 years to take America back. They got the presidency, the US Senate, the US House, they've now got the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, and Donald Trump has the court for the rest of my lifetime and the rest of all of your lifetimes, and everyone we think of, unless they're babies, maybe they have a shot, but the courts are gone. So they now have the Supreme Court, and most importantly in some ways, they have the control of most of the state level governments. And they understood when they built a plan that they had to first divide workers, then they had to focus on local elections and local issues and local precincts and city councils and mayors and school boards. The right wing did not wake up in 1973 and say, hey, let's take control of Congress and the presidency next year. Because A, they knew they couldn't. And B, they knew that they had to build locally to take the whole country, to build the kind of total power that they almost now have uh, in a scary way. So um, I think Everything meaningful that we do takes real planning work. And we have to do backwards planning. And I've spent a lot of time with both worker leaders um, and staff organizers, um, teaching them how to build war rooms, what we call a war room. I call it war rooms. Built a lot of war rooms. How do you build a giant room that has the power structure analysis on the walls, where our side is actually learning how to understand and think about power? and power structures, and which sector of workers can build more power fastest, because we have a climate crisis. So it'd be nice to organize every worker in Germany or the United States, but the truth is there are some workers who can build more power faster. That's, I'm gonna argue, I argue in the book, that's workers who can still hold supermajority strikes, who if they walk off the job, will create a crisis for capital and the corporations. Like we need to be deliberate and focused and smart about which sets of workers can create a crisis, um, and we do crisis creation by total all-out strikes. That's one way. Our political system is in big trouble in the United States. In the short term, we have to rebuild the unions, and we can actually do that much faster. So at every level, whether it's our political plan, whether here at stopping the AFD, whether it's reversing the far right in the United States, whether it's the Sweden Democrats, whoever it is in whatever country, like there are a set of things that we have to do as a progressive and left movement that are smart, that are based in a power analysis, that establish priorities, that set priorities, that we're focused on, that we're teaching people how to do in mass numbers, and then we have to be able to execute a smart plan. And that's the point of talking about the 2040 plan. Um, and I think we, in my experience as an organizer in the US, it's very infrequently that before we start a campaign or set out big goals, we try to figure out which location, which workers, which city, which state can we seize power in, 
where do we have to flip the electoral base to keep control of the country? I don't know if that's Bavaria or Saxonia or Berlin or wherever else it is, but like in our country, we have to be deliberate and clear about where, how, and when we can take power back. And we can do it faster on the trade union side because strikes, these kind of strikes, are defeating very powerful bosses the minute that 100,000, I mean 100% 100 of the workers walk out, we are actually defeating austerity in a series of strikes in the last 14 months in the US, which is very, very, very exciting. So I think that's what I mean. Like, we can't run away from planning. We have to take planning really seriously and goal setting and power structure analysis, or we're not gonna win big. Okay, ähm, vielen Dank. Ich habe jetzt noch ähm, eine Frage, bevor ähm, wir sozusagen auch für, für eure Fragen dann ähm, äh, öffnen können. Und ähm, äh, das wäre sozusagen, also im Moment passiert ja offensichtlich auch was. Ähm, also ähm, es gibt zum Beispiel die, die Lehrerstreiks und, und andere Streiks in den USA. Es gibt ähm, Bernie Sanders. Und ähm, meine Frage wäre einfach, bist du jetzt ein bisschen optimistisch, dass sich da ähm, in Sachen ähm, Plan für 2040 schon was getan hat? Um, uh, yes, um, but not with the Democratic Party, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, like I'm confident that there is a smarter generation, some younger, some older, uh, like me, working with uh, a lot of really smart young people. Like I think there are things happening. I think the climate crisis and the overall total destruction of the quality of workers' lives in the United States, um, uh, and then the election of Trump combined to signal to a lot of people, okay, this is not funny anymore. Um, it wasn't funny before, but it's really not okay right now. And in all of the places where we're seeing the 100% out strikes, massive power strikes, in almost all of them, this is the optimistic, the good side, the good, the good story, and it's real. Um, it took only two, three, or at most four years to totally rebuild these unions from unions that we would call kind of do-nothing unions, where nothing much was happening, where a handful of worker officials made all the decisions and sat behind closed doors and, you know, sort of like issued from on high, you know, some occasional notice, you know, to the workers, there shall be contract talks beginning Oh, they're over. You can vote or not. Here's your contract. Or it's time for political elections. We should support our candidates, whoever they are. Um, you know, and like not corrupt or anything. Just unions that don't have any, any relationship between the officials and the rank and file. Um, and in all of these unions, the changes that are happening are happening very fast. Um, and I think if in just one sector, which is the education sector, we can have a turnaround as fast as we're seeing it, um, I think it can happen in throughout the education sector, it can happen throughout the healthcare sector, there are more strikes happening already in the healthcare sector. They don't generally have the numbers that are this big because healthcare hospitals are mostly private sector, so there's a whole lot of great strikes going on in the hospital sector. We had the Verizon strike, we had the hotel workers Marriott strike. I mean, in the last year and a half, there have been more strikes, serious strikes in the United States than there has been in 25 years. Um, and that's because there's been a lot of quiet work, smart, quiet work of people organizing and s teaching methods and saying, okay, all that activism, kind of social media, all that stuff, okay, whatever. The way we're going to win is when we actually start to do what we call the deep organizing approach. So I, I am hopeful. I think that the Bernie Sanders dynamic in the U.S. is going to play out a lot like Jeremy Corbyn right now in the U.K., meaning it's from within the party that the vicious attacks are coming at him, more so than outside of the party. Um, but I think whether it's Bernie Sanders or a number of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or like a number of up-and-coming... Um, sort of political leaders, they're helping uh, reinforce to people that we need to keep doing a lot more of this um, in order, meaning a lot of strikes. Um, I think for the first time in my 
uh, adult life that you're seeing things like just bell, like weird bellwethers, like the New York Times editorial page is frequently supporting strikes all of a sudden. That's not normal <laughs> um, at all. So like you, I always say like, you know things have gotten really bad when the New York Times has returned to supporting workers on strike. Uh, not just an opinion page piece, but the actual editorial. Um, and they've been doing it um, in, the, in the case of the education strikes, maybe begrudgingly, but if you look at a number of indicators, you are seeing a lot of people begin to realize we cannot allow for the total destruction of unions. We can't allow for it at all. Not only that, but it, it's why we're in this crisis. It's why Donald Trump has support. It's because we destroyed, in the United States, actively destroyed the one organization that helps workers, enables workers to understand who's the real enemy, which is their boss, versus who is not. Um, certainly in the case of the, the employer class in the United States, they're vicious, they're brutal, they're not pro-worker, not even on a good day. Um, and so I feel uh, quite encouraged that we are heading in a much better direction. I don't know, I mean the Democratic Party is very capable, I mean if we had to put money on it, you know, the Democratic Party is very capable of destroying themselves. So if they get out of their own way, we might actually take the presidency um, and, and the Senate back. Um, but more importantly, and e or equally importantly, we're taking back control of a lot of the state houses. And they matter a lot in the US political system. So um, I am optimistic. But the thing that makes me, I guess, the most optimistic um, is this, and there's a relationship to Bernie Sanders, because honestly, the West Virginia teacher strike, the Chicago strike in 2012 by teachers in Chicago kind of began the resurgence we're having, but it was this strike in February of 2018 that really kicked off a whole new round of massive, massive strikes, and they're still going. And the most exciting thing about 2019 was we opened up with the Los Angeles um, teachers on strike in January. And right now, you have strikes happening today. Go strikes. Um, and in the United States, the Oakland teachers are on strike right now. They walked off the job last Thursday, and they're still out um, in a big city called Oakland. Um, and I don't think this is nearly en the end of it. So if workers, if really good workers, can contest for power inside of their unions and can make better unions, I actually think the fastest route to serious worker power, to stopping the rise of the far right in all of our countries is gonna come by a lot more strike activity, by which I mean 100% unity, out strikes. Um, because it changes politics. When you see these kind of strikes, it immediately begins to change the political discourse and the political system. So I am, despite many bad things around us everywhere, um, I am actually optimistic right now because uh, there's some really good signs. Um, ja, vielen Dank. Und um, genau, also wenn um, ihr oder sie um, Fragen habt um, oder auch uh, Diskussionsbeiträge, um, genau, dann um, meldet euch einfach. Um, ich versuche den Überblick uh, zu behalten und danach können wir vielleicht nochmal eine ne weitere Runde machen. Bisher äh, noch niemand. Jetzt, äh, okay, hier vorne ein und dann. Ähm, ah. Shall we collect a little bit? Okay. Um, 
Hier waren, glaube ich, zwei Fragen sogar. Ne? Okay, dann du. Und da hinten waren, habe ich auch zwei Fragen gesehen. Yes, um, uh, all um, great questions. Um, thank you. Um, so I think I'll just go in order. So uh, spontaneous. I guess the first thing I would say is I'm slightly skeptical that they're as spontaneous as they appear. Uh, because most things that, that are written about and talked about as spontaneous, like the general strikes in the United States in 1946, were anything but spontaneous. There was cadre all over, there were people working a plan, you know, there were sectors chosen. Um, so I interviewed for my second book, although it didn't make it um, in, for the dissertation that was before that book, um, I went around and I interviewed uh, dozens of people who were aged 90 years old or above and almost all of them have died just in the last few years. Um, and the list was, I was trying to find living organizers from the CIO, so from the 1930s and the 1940s. I wanted to actually talk to uh, people who had been involved in the biggest strikes in the United States, because many of them were called wildcat strikes, which means they were, the messaging, the narrative creation was that they were spontaneous. Um, and the very first person I interviewed, he's now died, named Robert Schrenk, uh, was a communist, as were most of them back in those days. Um, and he worked for the uh, Metal Workers Union, the IAM in our country, um, the International Association of Machinists, I should say. He was a, um, a, a machinist. Um, and there were massive machinist strikes um, but he also worked for the, C for the CIO formerly, for the more left wing of our two labor federations. So I was looking for CIO organizers who were involved in general strikes or wildcat strikes. And I said to him on the phone, then I went to meet him at his house, which was super fun, a whole bunch of them. And I said, so tell me about the wildcat strikes. And he just burst out laughing, you know, and he said, yeah, wildcat my ass. Um, so so I don't, I don't, it's not to say that there aren't, like there are. Um, and I, I wouldn't be able to judge enough about the Yellow Vest movement specifically to know. Certainly some of that's spontaneous, some of it's not. Um, what it's going to add up to in the end, I don't think we know yet. So I'm, I can't say that much about it, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply skeptical that there's a lot of, that there are many spontaneous things that either win, sustain themselves, are long lasting, and that are contributing to serious political change. Um, that's my general skepticism based on experience. Um, this strike that there's still a picture up of in West Virginia, um, even that uh, took the least amount of work of any of the big strikes that happened recently in the US, but even that was really 
depending on how you look at it, a year in the making, it was at least six months in the making of very hard work. Um, but the young, more young people than not who started the effort in West Virginia came out of the Sanders campaign. They had all been volunteering as um, education workers for Bernie Sanders. And then when Bernie Sanders didn't win in West Virginia, the same group of people began to think, well, what can we do, what can we do now with all this energy in West Virginia? And boy, they had a really good idea, <laughs> which is let's strike. Um, so um, might look spontaneous, nothing spontaneous about that picture. Um, so there are sometimes spontaneous things and sometimes they're fabulous. But I think if you look over the arc of time, when there has been real and substantial change, it's very rarely spontaneous. Um, and for narrative creation reasons and storytelling reasons, I think sometimes we like to act like that. Um, in Los Angeles, during the Los Angeles strike that just happened, you know, in the initial days there was even, and there still is, like lots of coverage of, of excited teachers, very excited to be on their picket line and on strike. And you would almost get the impression that in Los Angeles it, it took very little effort to get on strike. And that's just a lie. Um, it took four really serious years of building um, to have a massive 100% out strike. Um, doing everything I talked about, charting, finding the organic leaders, structure tests, sort of the method of the work that we do. So, um, so part, but getting to the second point you made, um, I don't know if it's true or not what you said, though I know in my country, um, there isn't even really a theory on the left of how, how could we possibly talk to everybody. There's just not even a theory about it, right? Mostly we just talk to people who already agree with us. Um, we write magazines for people and the people who read them agree with us already. And we do media work, that we promulgate to people and the people who read it are people who agree with us. Um, and that's a lot of what sort of the left or progressives or radicals or something historically have done in the US. And um, it, it, it's not building anything really new. Um, so the difference is if you wake up as a leftist, I think of myself as a leftist, if you wake up in the morning and you think, for us to be able to stop the AFD in Germany or push them back, or push the Trump supporters back, it means that we have to engage with them. Not the most racist, not the most, look, there are plenty, you know, there's, in the United States, the best estimates are that about 20% of the Trump base, 20% of it, is like hardcore, racist, sexist, misogynist, hateful. Within the, within the total base of Trump, about 20% represent people who I'm not gonna try and persuade to do anything except, I don't know, climb in the water or something, you know, go away. Um, but most people, there are, there are, there, I believe that there are a majority of people, um, at least going into the 2016 elections, who, who like uh, in the Brexit vote, I think were signaling disgust with the system. They were signaling, we're sick of all of you. We're sick of, we're sick of this. We don't trust any of you. You, the political establishment, we're sick of you, we're done with you. Um, and I think there's a lot of room between a hardcore, well-defined, misogynist, racist, and people who are just really frustrated with watching their children's lives go down the tubes in front of them. There's a really big gap of people in there. And our job is to get into that gap um, and identify them. And for me, the best way to do that is trade union work. Because we can form a common bond around a collective agreement or around a contract struggle or around a strike. And it's in the conversation with someone, the, bat, the campaign I was just talking about in Pennsylvania with Marne Payne, that one example, that campaign was playing out in 2016. Remember that year? Whew, it should be 2015 again, but anyway. In 2016, that organizing campaign with thousands of workers was happening in Pennsylvania, which is a, what we call a swing state, a crucial state, one of the 15 which meant, you know, people were all over that state. Um, people were coming in, Barack Obama would come in to campaign for Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama would come in to campaign for Hillary Clinton, um, and they'd get some big crowds. My favorite moment was Bruce Springsteen coming in. So they got this really big crowd, and they thought, oh, hey, Bruce Springsteen's here for Hillary Clinton. Look at the crowd, there's this huge crowd. Um, and it was a free concert by one of the best artists, you know, in our country in a long time. Um, 
And then like, if you were paying attention, in the middle of the state of Pennsylvania, Donald Trump was holding rallies, and he didn't have Bruce Springsteen, he has asshole self, and there were 35 and 45 and 50,000 people showing up to listen to him. Okay, well that's a problem. If Bruce Springsteen is getting less people than Donald Trump. Um, it means we better be paying attention to what the conversation is that they're having. So, you know, I think we have to engage with super majorities of people. And I have met and worked with, and in the campaign in 2016, I think began with a lot of people who said, who thought they were gonna vote for Trump, and by the end of the worker campaign were not voting for Trump. Because they, they themselves came to understand that the employer was a problem, that Trump was aligned with their employers, um, and that they were learning a new way to think um, about how to make change. So I think we have to engage. I, don't, I think there's a certain set of people will never change, and we quickly need to know who they are and not engage. But there's a lot of people who are really just angry and upset about the world around them, as are probably most of us in this room, right? We're, I'm upset about the world around me. Um, so, so that's one. And, and, and maybe I'm going to relate to the university student. I'm going to skip around for a minute to the question about climate change and urgency and, and why we engage people. Um, you know, so I started out, when I began to do full-time work, I was working full-time as an environmental um, organizer. Uh, my first 10 years in the work were as an environmental campaigner. I was doing environmental work. Um, and I care as passionately about the planet um, as I'm sure anyone does, meaning it, we're in deep trouble. Um, but still, to me, when I see how quickly the education unions are changing, and I see how quickly many workers I was working with in 2016 in Swing State, Pennsylvania, were shifting their thinking from Trump to realizing why they were gonna pull the lever, even though they had to maybe hold their nose, you know, for Hillary Clinton. Um, they had to come to their own understanding of why they were making that decision, right? Nothing we could do could tell them to, you can't tell people to do anything. We have to set up structures and processes that help let them realize that. So I think it's the same with climate change. Um, I think we have to act with as much urgency as ever, um, and there is nothing, there is nothing faster than the strikes we're seeing right now that can shift the kind of power that we need to solve the climate crisis as good strikes. And we don't need every single worker in every sector on strike, but we need a lot more workers on strike fast. Um, and they need to strike uh, in part to save the planet in the climate crisis. Um, so um, I think any university student who's an activist ought to dive straight into a good trade union um, and get to work um, or take a job in a sector that's a strategic sector and get to work um, as a rank and filer building a really good um, union and do it fast. Uh, because I always say when we do the work right, when we do the work correctly, when we do the work well, um, it will happen quickly, and it can happen quickly. And every campaign I have ever run, which is a lot, and they've been big, and they've been hard, and in the course of six months to a year, um, you can, as my first book title says, raise people's expectations that they and their families deserve more and can win. We can raise people's expectations that we can save the planet. What makes me crazy about the climate movement, oftentimes in my country, is that they like lead with death and destruction and death and fear and fear and death. And just note to self, that's not an organizing strategy. Um, terrorizing people that the planet's gonna blow up is not a very effective way to actually get them to take serious action. Um, so um, quickly on the obligatory um, question, I, I, don't th I think good unions don't need an obligatory due structure um, at all. Uh, we've had it in the U.S., sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. In the United States, we mostly don't have obligatory anymore. It's not there. Um, this strike is the answer to voluntary membership because this, the, oh no, that one. Well, they're voluntary. First of all, they're a voluntary structure. Um, but so are these people now, right? Because we had a Supreme Court decision in the United States called the Janus decision, or the way it said here, the Yanis decision, um, that made it so that the entire public sector across the entire United States of America can no longer have any obligatory membership system. So to me, 
if you build a good union, meaning a union that workers own, that's theirs, it's not a problem paying dues. And we're seeing that. So in Los Angeles, those 32,000 workers, 95% of them are members of the union. 95% are voluntarily paying dues and they're voluntarily. So to me, it's if you build a good union, you don't have to worry about an obligatory structure. If you have a bad union, well, that's a different problem. Uh, so, um, and then lastly, uh, deep organizing um, on the education question. Yeah, parents are deeply involved. The community is deeply involved. Um, to talk about the Los Angeles education strike, which is such a good model, so is Chicago, so are many of them, but in all of the big education strikes, um, the students and the parents were deeply involved. They were invited into the process. They were structured into the process. When they were making the actual union contract proposals, like what would be in the workers' contract in Los Angeles in the fall of 2017, they began to hold giant wide open meetings and invite the parents and the students to the meeting with the workers to decide what kind of schools the students and the parents and the teachers all wanted. So that's radical inclusion of the families whose kids go to the schools. Um, and there was a very deliberate and serious effort to bring the students and the parents in a structured way, just as structured as the worker organizing building, the parent outreach was just as systematic and just as structured. The union hired a parent organizer full time, then they hired a second parent organizer full time, um, and they had a whole substructure in the union that did nothing but work with the parents so that work mostly happened through the teachers. Like the structure was, the teachers got strong first, they built a high membership in unity, and then once the teachers were strong, they then, the teachers themselves then began to have goals about how many parents of the students could they get signed on to say, we're ready to be involved in a campaign to build better schools. So it was never envisioned as a pay strike or a strike about money. It was a strike for social good. It was a strike to save the public education system in the United States from the privatizers and the corporations. And there was no top-down community alliance, top-down crap happening in that campaign. It was um, teacher to student to parent up. So if you have a bottom-up worker model, you can have a bottom-up community model um, from the workers' movement. Um, and bring in the parents systematically through the students and through the teacher relationship. So it's a very serious part of the work. And every campaign I have ever run in my life has always put the community as central to every bit of the struggle. Because what I talk about in the book, in No Shortcuts, is that when I see a worker, I see a whole person. I don't just see, like, what's a worker? Like, they don't sleep on the job, like, they go home and they have lives, and they live in communities, and they live in houses, and they have a uh, housing crisis, and they have a public transportation crisis, and the cost of transit is rising, and the schools are declining, because that's what neoliberalism is doing to everybody. So why should the union only work as a union at work? It just never made sense to me. Um, the union is for the worker, and in our training, um, the workers get to decide what their union does. Um, so it should work on issues at work, it should work on issues at home, um, and it should be a major source of power building for every worker um, on any issue that matters to them. Thanks. Um, ich sehe, äh, genau, schon die nächsten äh, vier Fragen. <lacht> Würde ich einfach direkt eine, die neue Runde ähm, aufmachen. Ähm, du warst zuerst in der Ecke.
Hello. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is also a problem in the United States, but at least where I'm from, uh, a big problem in that sense is what we call the liberalization of the or the flexibilization of the work market, the labor market, which means that many people are actually forced into freelance work, whereas 10 years ago they would have gotten a regular contract, so to say. And I was just curious if that development kind of changes your approach and your structure or if actually you think that it doesn't matter at all. Da waren noch zwei andere Meldungen. I have a question on strikes in hospitals and nursing homes. You're writing about uh, in No Shortcuts. How do, can I envision a, a strike day within the hospital when all workers are out? Same in nursing homes. What happens to the people with need of care? Um, how do you work towards the community? You know. Da war noch jemand, oder? Ah, hier, okay. Ja, meine Frage, die Chefs in den Unternehmen, die haben ja sicher Gegenstrategien entwickelt. Wie sahen die aus und wie seid ihr damit umgegangen? Uh, I'm just going to start, I think, backwards first on this one. Um, the employers um, don't have a counter strategy. It's the employers had the strategy to begin with. Those of us who are now winning developed, like had to pull back the strategies as the counter strategies uh, from the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so that's our approach. Uh, our approach is, again, not new. We're, we're reaching back into a time in the United States when we had a much more effective trade union movement, much more effective. Um, and those of us who are beginning to practice those skills again um, are the ones figuring out how to actually defeat the employers. In the third book I wrote that's, that will come out next, um, I just finished the whole first draft of it before I came to Germany. I always say, thank you, Germany, for giving me a big deadline. Um, uh, I talk... The second chapter of the book is called, Where Did All the Unions Go? And I'm talking a lot about the employer offensive and how the employers um, divide the workers and attack the workers. And it's sort of like I'm linking the narrative to 2015 and 2016 in America at large, right? Because Donald Trump led a boss war. What we call a boss war, an employer war, an employer offensive against the workers is just what we saw with Steve Bannon um, and Donald Trump in the United States of America. So the employers have the strategy, as I outline. Um, I talked more about it probably in my first book, a little bit in the second book, but a lot in the third book. Um, they began, actually the official first dedicated union buster in the United States came from the big department star called Sears and Robux. Um, he began to bring behavioral psychologists from the University of Chicago into the department stores in the late 1930s in the US to devise psychological warfare mechanisms against the CIO organizers in the late 1930s. And one of the first things they began to do was they created, um, they created worker surveys um, that they put out to workers and they made workers think that they were actually really interested in their opinion. Um, and those early worker surveys by what became the professional union busters by the 1940s and 1950s um, were really just so that they could figure out exactly what workers were pissed off at work. And that's where they went to attack the workers and fire them um, before they could even think of forming a union. So the technology of, of official union busting is pretty old in the US, like official union busting methods that involve security, scaring people, psychological warfare, um, in almost every big campaign that I have had the pleasure of working with workers with, um, the employers are using all of these mechanisms. Um, in the fight where Marnay was at Einstein Hospital, they brought in IRI Inc., IRI Incorporated, um, which is today 
um, among the most effective union busting firms. So this is a firm, that's all they do. That's all they do. They have no other job. They have lawyers, they have thugs, like people who scare people, um, and they have behavioral psychologists, literally, um, who play psychological operations on the workers in one-on-one -on -one meetings and group meetings. Um, and the, the best way that for those of us who beat them, who teach workers to beat them, do it, is we tell the workers everything that's gonna happen. And we can tell the workers everything that's gonna happen. We have a word for it, it's called inoculation. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like inoculation. Like when you get a vaccine to not get the flu, um, you get a little bit of the poison, right? You get, when you're getting a vaccine so you don't get the flu, what you're doing is putting a little bit of the flu in your arm first to stop the flu. So that's sort of the analogy we use in the US is that we, we talk to the workers about the boss's poison before the poison starts. And we actually explain, here's the poison that's coming. And here's how you can actually defeat the employer. And the way you can defeat the employer is when you get the vast majority of you, a super majority of you, united together, unit by unit, shift by shift. And then if it was in a big sectoral, place by place, state by state, city by city. Um, so we have a whole strategy of actually really sharing with workers in campaigns as early as we can in the campaign. The employers will do X, Y, and Z. And if we prepare the workers for it, um, it works much better because then they realize, oh, my, my boss isn't so special. My boss is just opening up Union Busting 101, Smash the Workers Book 4, and doing that. Right, so we're trying to like reduce the union busters to the not very clever thugs that they are. Um, uh, so that's why I would just say, the employers, I have their manuals, they steal their manuals, we steal theirs, like we have them. Um, what we don't do is teach enough workers actually how to get ready for the employer offensive or how to beat it. Um, and then, uh, so that's on counter strategies, like whose is it, ours or theirs. Um, and then um, on the question of the structures, I would have to know much like that exact, exact example um, from the hospital to be able to explain it. But I would say generally two things. Part of why I wrote no shortcuts, no half things, is because it's exact, the exact problem that you're describing is what was becoming systematized um, at a number of the big unions, mostly through SEIU because they would hire organizing teams, send in really top talent, build a really great structure, and then immediately pull them all out. And they weren't teaching the workers actually how to build a sustainable, strong structure. Um, and I outlined that in chapter three, the chapter called Class Struggle or Class Snuggle. Um, because the Class Snuggle approach um, was one that I know is in Germany, by the way, right now. I, I don't want to name names, but there are people from that model, from that time in the United States, living in Europe right now and working with European unions. Um, and, and passing that model on into Europe. And it's a death blow. Do not follow it. If you only move in a bunch of good organizers for a short, and I don't mean not ever, like, Bringing people in for a campaign is one thing, and we need extra help, I need extra help. But the unions have to leave good staff in place. The unions themselves have to build permanent organization. You may use an overflow of a bunch of really smart people for a period of time, that's fine. But you have to have a mechanism that's teaching the workers how to build and sustain worker organization. In the method I showed about the wall charts, like part of why this matters so much is because in this approach, we are teaching the workers how to do this. In the approach that became dominant for a period of time at SEIU and then changed to WIN and then a bunch of other things, um, the, the staff would be directed to never, sh never really share these charts with the workers and even more to the point, there are people running around Europe right now, training unions in Europe, who teach the organizers to rip up the charts and not let anyone see them because they're trying to keep control of the workplace after the big election. 
So it's really deep. Um, that's not organizing, in my opinion. That's a campaign. Um, and the theory was, and the theory is, to, to be honest, to, to, be, to be fair to them, they have a theory. They believe. They're, they believe that their theory is we have to grow. It's a very important word. Grow, not organize. We have to grow the union membership. We have to grow. It's like workers are like a plant and you pour water on them or something. You have to grow the dues base. You have to grow the density. And then once we get back to like, in our country their theory was, once we get back to like 20% density, because we're at a much lower number now, once we get back to 20%, then workers can start winning again. Well, you know what? I have never met a worker in my life who fought their ass off against a union buster to win a union election, to then be told, you shouldn't expect very much in your contract. We'll get back to you in 20 years. No. <laughs> Sorry. That's where the structures fall apart. Um, if you go into Chicago schools right now, you will find schools with structure. If you go back to the, these workers right now in Pennsylvania, you will go back and find all the workers in structure. In fact, they're still calling me. So Jane, three years later, we still have to keep the charts up to date? Yes! Right? So for those of us who believe in actually teaching workers to do it and demystifying the magic outside organizer, um, we're teaching workers how to do it and the importance of worksite structure, structure tests, and constantly engaging in campaigns, constantly engaging in campaigns. I should say one quick word about that. The whole method of this kind of organizing suggests that we do two things. One is we teach the workers. These are the methods that you use in an ongoing way to solve problems in the workplace. You don't start relying on Fulton officials who file grievances and legal paperwork to fix a problem at work. What often happens once there is a union is we have like full-time officials who file pieces of paper legally to fix problems with a legal approach to the workplace. And that deadens, that crushes the worker spirit. So when we have problems in the workplace, we use the same methods, the same mechanisms. We're like, oh, they're shorting the workers on the third shift. Um, well, we could file a legal objection because the contract says you can't do that. And that won't involve anybody. Or we can go do a big majority petition and have all the workers on the third shift sign a petition saying, you're violating our contract. And we're going to start implementing worker actions against the unit manager until you fix it, right? So that's a way that you sustain worker energy between big strikes and big activity. So one is you have to believe in it and you have to care. And if you believe in care, if you believe and you care about building, teaching workers themselves to build sustainable structures, you can teach them to do it. Um, and there's a lot of very sustainable worker structures um, in the US. So um, I think that uh, takes on some of that question. Um, a hospital, okay, this gets to the, this gets to legal separation, different legal rules. Um, and I don't think you want our model, but we get 100% out because in our country they bring in strike breakers and they bring in what we call scabs, which means they hire workers usually from the same place where they're building the Mercedes and the BMW plant, thank you, Germany, which is in the deep south, right, where there's no unions. But that's where, that's, where, that's where the German auto plants are coming in the US, right, is where workers have no unions um, and where Jim Crow was in the deep south and slavery. Um, in our country, that's where most of the strike and replacement workers come from. So we can get 100% out in our hospital strikes and a nurse strike because every single worker is walking out, we have to legally give 10 days notice. So we have to declare the strike 10 days beforehand. Workers in our case will vote for it, we will have done a million structure tests before it, and we'll go 100% out. And if we do it right, and this is, this is careful, if we do it right, if we do it right, it will be, it'll wind up in such a way, realize this camera's going, so I'm speaking carefully but it will wind up in such a way that it becomes a lockout, which is a different legal term than a strike, but it is functionally still a strike, like it's a strike, because we've engineered it so that the employer will have to pay the workers um, after the strike, and they'll have to pay 100% of the strike breakers, and it's a very, very, very expensive proposition at that point. So a lot of the incentive is about um, that they're paying a double payroll squared because the strike breakers get paid like, if a, if a regular nurse 
and a medical surgical floor is getting $45 an hour, the strike breaking nurse is getting $100 an hour for the same job because they have to cross a picket line uh, and they get two or three times the pay. So it becomes a very, very expensive proposition. But that's only in healthcare. The only place that happens is in healthcare, right, where you're not, we're not going to let the patients die. And I understand in Germany, depending on how you do it, you can actually close whole units. And that sounds awfully effective to me too, right, where they're moving patients from ward to ward and out of the facility. So that's also super effective. Um, and then on the question of freelance work um, and contract work in the platform economy, um, uh, there are definitely more people who are having to freelance right now um, than there used to be, for sure. But I'm not sure I think the methods are any different um, of how we actually organize the workers. They might require us um, to network differently, but the fundamentals of the method I think are still the same. So that's one thing. But the second thing is there are a lot less there's a lot less of the freelance work than we think. Um, and I know it's true in the US, and I'm certain it's true in a bunch of Europe where I've looked at the numbers. So there's a lot of like hyped up conversation about the platform economy and freelancing and you know, like tomorrow all of our, every single person here is gonna be working for Uber. Um, I hope not, but you know, that, there's a lot of talk like that. So first of all, we have to have strategies to deal with that because it's not okay. But the question is, what's the real strategy to deal with that? And I think that the best strategy to deal with that is our capacity to quickly elect, to create some crises through other big strikes, where workers are not in the platform economy yet, um, and to be able to quickly regain control politically so that we can actually pass laws that prevent um, the freelancization of the universe. So, you know, if I was in charge of the universe, which I'm not, but if I was, um, I think the priority focus has to be on workers who can still effectively strike if they're enabled to by the trade, you know, if they're enabled to because they take control and decide to strike. So for me, the 2040, 2020, or 2025 strategy, 2025 is like, let's focus, focus, not exclude anyone else, we're not excluding anyone, but let's focus on the workforces and the workplaces where workers can still actually get to doing mass strikes and use the mass strikes to shift the political discussion, to shift who we're voting for, to get power, to get politicians back in power who will actually just pass laws saying, you can't call a freelance worker a freelance worker if what they're doing is working side by side another worker doing the same job. That's just a lie, right? So we need stronger laws to stop a lot of that. Um, so then, the, then you're, you could be caught in a chicken and egg. Well, how do we get the laws to stop that? Well, we get the laws because we need more power. So in, in the short term, I think we have to focus a lot on rebuilding power in the sectors where workers can still have really massive strikes, which then change the political possibilities. And then we get politicians that we can actually hold accountable um, to stop sort of the freelance, the, the ability of employers to just turn workers who 10 years ago were full-time workers with pension, health care, rights on the job into freelance. Like we need to stop it from happening. And at the same time, we see some great examples. Um, I would say mostly in England right now with the IGWB and a handful of unions where they're actually doing really good work, um, working with workers who are more in the platform economy. And they're actually finding mechanisms to hold minority strikes, to do disruption, to bring the community in. Um, all of those kind of strategies still. Um, and even a bit, you know, little, little pockets of it in the U.S. too. So I don't think it's impossible. I think it's possible, but I think it is harder. Um, and I think we should focus on workplaces where we can really have massive strikes um, as fast as we can to stop employers from tur turning jobs into freelance jobs. Ja, ähm, vielen Dank. Ähm, also wir haben sagen jetzt noch Zeit für ähm, eine letzte Fragerunde. Ich habe auch noch ähm, zwei Fragen und zwar, ähm, also schreibst du auch, dass, ähm, ähm, also das Linke, beziehungsweise im Englischen steht da ähm, Progressives and Liberals alike, ähm, die sollen sagen, äh, das Buch lesen, ähm, verstehen und äh, die Kernstrategien anwenden und ähm, 
also ich sitze wahrscheinlich auch hier und, und darf heute moderieren, weil, ähm, äh, weil ich das alles relativ überzeugend finde. Und ähm, es gibt ähm, sagen in den Gewerkschaften in Deutschland ja Ansätze ähm, äh, fürs Organizing. Das ähm, gibt es auch in der Linken, also sowohl in, in der Partei als auch, ähm, als auch außerhalb. Und ähm, also was wir zum Beispiel machen, ist ähm, sagen genau zu versuchen, sozusagen nicht nur mit den Leuten zu sprechen, mit denen wir immer sprechen oder Veranstaltungen zu machen, wo dann 20, 30 Leute kommen, die sozusagen ähm, häufig zu politischen Veranstaltungen gehen, sondern eben auch mit Leuten ins Gespräch zu kommen, ähm, die vielleicht noch nie organisiert waren, die vielleicht noch nie auf einer Demo waren oder so ähnlich. Und eine, ähm, eine Sache, die wir machen, ist halt ähm, so ähm, Organisierungsprojekte in einkommensarmen Nachbarschaften, ähm, wo ich bei einem sozusagen auch mitmache ähm, in Berlin hier, ähm, wo es um steigende Mieten geht, weil das einfach so ein, äh, so ein Riesenproblem für die Leute ist, sozusagen, dass die, dass die Mieten halt massiv ansteigen. Und ähm, ein Problem, auf das man natürlich dann stößt, ist, ähm, äh, dass man dann vielleicht viele gute ähm, Beispiele hat. Also wenn sozusagen Leute ähm, sozusagen eher fragend reingehen und gucken, wo ist eigentlich ähm, das Problem und dass man dann sozusagen gemeinsam ähm, sich organisiert, um das anzugehen. Ähm, also das funktioniert ähm, häufig sehr gut <lacht> sozusagen und man kommt tatsächlich mit vielen Leuten ins Gespräch, ähm, mit denen man sonst nicht sprechen würde. Ähm, aber das ähm, Problem ist natürlich, dass es dann einzelne Beispiele sind und, ähm, und vor dem Hintergrund dessen, was um uns herum passiert, ähm, stelle ich mir dann manchmal die die Frage, ähm, sagen, wie kann man das auf eine andere Ebene heben? Also sagen, wenn wir im, im Englischen über Scale äh, sprechen, ähm, im Deutschen kann ich es nicht so gut ähm, übersetzen, aber das ist sozusagen eine, ähm, eine Frage, die ich, äh, die ich mir manchmal stelle. Und das andere ist sozusagen, also wenn wir ähm, äh, wenn wir sozusagen Deep Organizing anwenden wollen, ähm, einerseits in den Gewerkschaften, dazu hast du auch schon viel gesagt, aber zum Beispiel auch als, als politische Partei, ähm, wie müsste das dann aussehen, sozusagen, was wären deine, ähm, äh, deine Vorstellungen jetzt außerhalb auch von Gewerkschaften, was eigentlich die Aufgaben sind? Ähm, und ich würde jetzt aber direkt, also wenn ihr noch Fragen habt, das auch noch direkt mit, ich sehe zwei, ähm, vielleicht kann man das Saalmikro noch einmal rumgeben und dann sozusagen die letzte Runde äh, an Jane geben. Ja, äh, hallo, ich hätte mal die Frage, du hast ganz viel über den Dienstleistungssektor geredet, also die Lehrer und die äh, Geschichten in den Krankenhäusern, in, die Pflege, äh, in dem Pflegebereich. Äh, der große, sozusagen, da fehlt ja der große Bereich der Produktion und du hast ja sozusagen angeschlossen in den 30er Jahren in Amerika, äh, in den USA, die großen Streiks, die sozusagen ja in der Produktion, in der Industrie geführt wurden. Wie sieht es denn eigentlich sozusagen in dem Sektor aus? Äh, das ist die eine Frage. Und die zweite Frage ist dann vielleicht noch, dass es natürlich ein Problem gibt, wenn man natürlich eine Kampagne in der Gewerkschaft macht, irgendwie, die dann im besten Falle hoffnungsvoll sozusagen äh, erfolgreich zu Ende geführt hat. Das gibt es natürlich sozusagen eine, ein kleines Loch, in das die Leute ja dann fallen, weil man macht ja nicht gleich wieder dieselbe Kampagne. Und die Frage ist natürlich schon, äh, wie kann man sozusagen sowas verstetigen? Äh, du hast natürlich recht, das ist natürlich das Banalste von der Welt zu sagen, Natürlich muss man die Leute einbeziehen, wenn man die nicht einbezieht bei solchen Kampagnen, dann sind die natürlich sofort weg. Aber schlussendlich, wenn man sie einbezieht, ist es ja auch nicht so, dass man dann tagtäglich da sozusagen Kämpfe führt. Da gibt es ja auch noch den Alltag, irgendwie, der auch noch irgendwie einfach eintritt. Und da schließt sich sozusagen indirekt dann auch die dritte und heute die letzte Frage an. Irgendwie, du hast gesagt, dass äh, es ja nicht nur sozusagen um die Kämpfe auf Arbeit für die materiellen Verbesserungen der Arbeitsbedingungen dass es darum geht, sondern sozusagen man soll das verbinden mit den Kämpfen sozusagen in einem Reproduktionssektor, Zwecks Mieten, Quatsch wohnen etc. Bla bla. Da würde mich mal interessieren, wie du sozusagen das Verhältnis zwischen den ökonomischen Organisierungen sozusagen und den politischen Organisierungen sozusagen setzt, weil natürlich äh, könnte man natürlich eine längere Lenkfristigkeit herstellen, wenn man äh, sozusagen ab einem bestimmten Punkt sozusagen eine langfristige politische Organisation irgendwie dahinter aufbauen könnte. Und weil auch in den 90er Jahren in Deutschland irgendwie äh, viele junge Menschen dachten auch damals und schauen wir bis heute immer noch, dass sozusagen der Gewerkschaftskampf sozusagen der spannende, romantisch und erfolgreich ist, weil man da relativ zügig äh, Erfolge sieht, die dann vielleicht eintreten, aber langfristig sozusagen verpufft ist und ab einem bestimmten Zeitpunkt fängt man wieder von vorne an. Eine Frage gab es noch irgendwo, ne? Ja. ja, ja. Okay, ähm, 
Vorher kam auch schon die Frage in der ersten Runde über Mobilisierungen, wo es dann auch um Klimagerechtigkeit geht. Jetzt haben wir auch wieder viel gesprochen über Mobilisierungen, wo es um Arbeitsplatzfragen geht. Ich wollte dich fragen, Jane, ob du Erfahrungen hast in Bereichen, wo an der Oberfläche so aussieht, dass diese zwei Themen sich irgendwie entgegenstehen. Beispiel gerade in Deutschland auch jetzt wieder Kohlearbeiterinnen, die um ihren Verlust von ihrem Arbeitsplatz fürchten, gegenüber dem Interesse schnell mit dem Verbrennen von Kohle aufzuhören. Ähm, hast du da irgendwelche Erfahrungen, wie auch die einfach mh, von Leuten, die ihr mit in dieses Organizing mit einbezieht, darüber gesprochen wird, dass trotzdem sich das dadurch nicht ja, von beiden Seiten verpufft, weil man irgendwie so im Dilemma steht. Um, backwards, uh, because yeah, because one issue fights lead to what do we do in between the big fights and leads to political strategy and parties and how do we win? So I'm going to go slightly backwards, um, and I maybe show a few more images. Um, so I think on the question of jobs and the environment, uh, the question of climate crisis, um, the explicit division. Um, using the weapon called jobs versus the environment was a strategy hatched in the 1970s um, by a handful of very, you know, the same corporations that were plotting to um, divide women um, in, when women were fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment in our country in the 1970s. The right wing invented an organization called Housewives and Mothers Against the ERA. Uh, it's very clever people, very, very clever. And they, pit, they pitted the right to be a mother against the right to the Equal Rights Amendment, right? These are some clever people. So that the same people who have now fomented climate denialism are the same people who in the 1970s created what we call a wedge issue, a divisive issue said, that said you can either have a good job or you can have a clean planet, but you can't have both, right? That jobs versus the environment was like the strategy that they created. Um, and that would be like an entire evening topic in some ways on its own, uh, which I don't think we have time for, but I think it's not any different. How we connect with people on the climate issue is not any different than how we connect with them about what they want to change at work. Um, we start by asking people, um, what are the things that matter to them? What do they want to change? Um, when it comes to the climate question, I have not met um, a worker who's a parent Many workers are parents, last I looked. I've not met one worker who's a parent yet, where if we actually discuss um, the immediate uh, ways that their children's lives may be affected, they don't actually care. But it's about connecting to people personally um, through conversations, where they come to understand like their own self-interest, and then part of our job as, mo as, as movements is to help people go from their immediate self-interest into a larger sense of collective interests. Um, and I think that that does relate to both of the other questions that were asked, uh, as I'm going to wind my way this way. Um, so I've talked about the service sector mostly just because it's the sectors I organize in. I organize in the education sector and in the healthcare sector for most of my adult life, though I worked with auto workers, I worked with janitors, you know, I worked with all kinds of workers in my earlier years. Um, when I was working for the National Trade Union Confederation, I worked for whoever I was assigned to, which is a lot of different workers. Um, I began to work more with the service sectors that I'm focused on, not just the service sectors, what I call the mission-driven sectors in the economy, which is education and healthcare, um, because I'm in a hurry, because we're all in a hurry, because <laughs> we need r radical change fast if we're going to stop the climate crisis. And to me, when I look at the education and healthcare sectors in, in the biggest, with the biggest eyeglasses on, I see a sea of women and I see a sea of women who more naturally, just more naturally, connect up what's happening at home to the workplace um, than most male workers that I know do. Because they can't separate putting food on the table or paying the rent or whatever else is happening in their lives. Like, it tends to be that they make the connection to issues that are larger than the workplace fairly quickly. Um, 
And so those are sectors that I'm very keen to because we have such a low number of workers and unions. To me, it's like, what's the maximum potential power to expand our power? And as we're seeing in the education strikes, there were 65,000 people in Los Angeles every day of the strike, but there's only 32,000 teachers, which means they were picking up 35 to 40,000 parents a day who were taking off the day to march with them. So that's strategy to me, right? It's like, how can we align ourselves with a set of workers who have an organic connection to their community? Like, if you are a teacher, you know thousands of students and you know thousands of parents. So it's like one worker, but it's like triple the effect because they know the students and the parents. If you're a healthcare worker, you meet the family, you meet the, you meet the patient, you meet the family of the patient. Um, certainly in a long-term care environment, you're in an ongoing relationship with the entire family of the older person you're dealing with. Even in a hospital situation, nurses are immediately meeting uh, families in the room. Believe me, they talk all about it, right? Anyone here a nurse? Ah, <gasps> shocking. One, there we go, yeah. So it's like, yeah. So anyway, but like, you know, so you have to deal, with, you, they have to learn very quickly how to like bring the whole family into a discussion about personal health care decisions. Like, they're effectively skilled at a bunch of skills that we need in our societies to get to scale faster. Like, they get us to scale faster because one teacher is three different constituencies. One healthcare worker is multiple constituencies. It's sort of fascinating. So it's not that I, again, I don't, it's not that I don't think other sectors matter, I do. Another one that I talk a lot about, which is more obvious, is the transport and logistics sector, right? Everyone involved in getting a package from evil Amazon somewhere else, or from Walmart or any other company anywhere, um, is deeply involved in just-in-time production and transit um, and logistics. They're hugely important sectors. They're challenging in different ways. They don't as quickly organically connect to the community. Um, but they really matter. The production sector in the U.S. Um, is, you know, small. It's just small at this point. There just aren't um, a lot of big factories, as we thought of them, left over. The big factories in the United States right now are hospitals and schools and universities. Like, that's who the factories are, which is why I've spent my entire adult life inside of them. They are the closest thing we have to the big factories today left in the United States. In most communities, the largest employer in the community is either healthcare or education. Healthcare is number one, or education is number one, and healthcare is number two, or education is number two. In most communities, because the manufacturing kind of plants are gone. Um, and where they do exist, we absolutely need to help those workers form unions, um, and we're terrible at it. We're just, because the unions involved in that sector haven't figured it out. Um, those are the really hard fights that are in the deep south, um, like at the BMW plant, like at the Mercedes plant, like at the Toyota plant, like at the Kia Korean car plant. These are all in a handful of states in the deep south where workers were kept in full slavery until fairly recently in society. You know, so getting those regions from like slavery to Jim Crow apartheid, to like having the confidence and the ability to unionize uh, is a giant and monumentally important effort. Um, and I think we're not doing it very well right now. In my experience, with any worker I've met in any kind of campaign, I think I said this earlier today somewhere else, but I really, really believe this because it's really my experience. I have never had the experience where a good plan was made that the workers themselves were involved in, where people who are skilled in the skill of struggle, that's experienced organizers, were helping them come up with good options to take action and take risk. You know, walking out in our country, it's a lot of risk, big strike risk. Um, I've never met large numbers of workers who when they saw what we call a credible plan to win, the word credible is super important, like a credible plan to win, like, workers are not stupid, they're really smart. So when a union stands up and offers up a plan that's really not credible, uh, they're probably gonna leave the meeting and go the other direction. On the other hand, if you lay out a really comprehensive plan to win, and then you say, what do you think, and how can you yourself make this plan better, 
because you know more than we do about what's going on here, and you start to change the plan and make it even better, um, there's really high likelihood that the workers are going to fight and fight like hell and win. Um, so I think that's true in general with workers. Um, and all of that shifts a little bit to the question of scale. Um, and how do we scale it up? And how do we build uh, stronger political parties that can help us um, expand the work out? And I think it really isn't any different in part than the work that you're doing, that you're starting um, with some of the housing fights, for example. To me, it's just, and I was gonna show a few more slides. I was reaching for this because I'm gonna show just a few more pictures. But for me, the principles of the work are the same. So to scale up in the political work, we have to find structures where we can do organizing work. By the way, these are the structure tests. Those little dots on the charts are these. Um, like these hand-signed giant petitions are the dots on the charts. They're what we call the structure tests. And we're constantly doing them. We're constantly doing them. You can see workers in this picture doing the work on their own wall charts, right, in a big worker meeting. Um, but so when we, when we take the core principles and we scale it out into the community, there we go. When we scale the work out and we begin to understand that the same set of principles of how we do the work, um, the way I'm describing it in the workplace, and it answers a part of the question of how do you keep the MACDM involved, because definitely anyone after a big campaign gets tired and needs to take a big nap. Let everyone go take a big nap. If you go through a big hard struggle and you win, Everyone needs to go home, see the kids, play with the family, check in with whoever, um, and take a nap. But not for too long. Um, and the way that we keep them involved is that we realize that if the union acts like a union at work, it can also act like a union at home. And so we begin to take on other issues. And we take on the other issues because the workers themselves choose what the issues are. They actually make the decisions about what the issues are outside of the contract and outside of the workplace that actually they want to work on. So this is a picture of two workers um, whose houses were about to be bulldozed. And they were going to be part of a big gentrification plan. Only no one told them. Um, and they found out about it. And they had, they were in worker negotiations, two nursing home workers, Marie Pierre and Joan Fang. This is many years ago, year 2000. Um, and they wanted to um, figure out how to save their houses, those houses, from being knocked over to make room for rich people's housing. You know, and to make a too long story short, we basically got, seri we seriously said, all right, the unions have to not just help workers learn to win a $2 an hour raise, we actually have to figure out how to teach workers to save their own housing and how to teach workers to fight for better schools and better transit. But we couldn't impose those issues on them. So we actually began a worker-to-worker, one-on-one -worker, um, conversation process in the workplaces, and I've been doing this ever since, everywhere, um, where we say, OK, now that you want a great contract, what do you want to do next? Because if we work on big issues that matter to workers outside of the workplace, it's a way to keep them engaged and keep their skill development happening and keep their participation happening, but they're doing it on a different front and they're doing it on an issue that matters to them, like housing. Um, so whether I'm the party coming at building a housing structure or the union, the same principles apply. We've got to prioritize where we're going. If we want to win a housing fight, um, an anti-gentrification campaign, we have to be smart. We have to do a power analysis, a power structure analysis of the city that we're in. We have to do some research on what the CEOs and corporations and the super rich are planning to do to our city. We have to then begin to target strategically which of these places are big, which of these places can we, if we get inside there as a political party and invest some energy in expanding our base, we're gonna do it by teaching people how to save their housing development first, and we're gonna connect that directly to the party that we're part of. And they're gonna understand that it actually takes more than just one fight to save their housing. They actually need to have a party and a political party and politicians in office 
who are going to actually fight to long-term change the laws so that they can't just bulldoze housing, right? So for me, if I want to scale up, um, it looks a lot like this. This was unions getting involved with the rank and file workers. Um, all we did in this campaign was go into the backyards in a bunch of places where they were going to gentrify the housing and do a couple of trainings with our best worker leaders. Um, and the worker leaders were all over the housing developments. And they themselves, because they were skilled up in a strong workplace campaign, had the kind of skill it took then to begin to organize among the housing developments so that they could actually save um, their housing. And we began to build a very explicit structure from the base of the unions. These were four unions. We began to chart all of the rank and file members of the unions um, into each of the, in this case, each of the housing developments that were slated for demolition. So our anti-gentrification campaign began in Oak Park, became very big and very famous, and it was uh, four unions. These are the four unions. And we just said, we're, what, let's all find out where all the workers live, and let's begin to build a tenant union out of the workers' union across the city to block gentrification. And any worker who wanted to be involved in saving their housing could be involved. But we were connecting it to the union. And then we were connecting it to building alternative political parties in the region so that workers could actually connect the dots between politics and political power and workplace power and worker power and building other structures in the community that then allow us um, to seize power. So I want to just get to a couple pictures. Like, these are pictures from the anti-gentrification campaign, and you will get a sense of the scale of the fight. Um, unions don't traditionally in the U.S. get involved in things like this, and neither do political parties. And it's to our peril, because the way to meet people and engage with people is to work on issues that matter to them and help teach them how to win. And when we teach them how to win, they then will join our parties because they realize, holy crap, that was power, right? And they will join the unions if the unions are doing this kind of work. Um, so for me, it's the same strategy. It's being strategic. It's which city, which state in Germany, which city in Germany, which housing units, which political precinct. Do we have to go right at the AFD somewhere? Well, that might take us in a different direction. Do we have to peel off the whatever it is political party to build more for the left party? Well, then we might have to go in this um, region of the country or this city. So we need a power analysis and we need a strategy, whether we're a union or a party. And we need to think carefully and do some research and figure out what is the best strategy to stop the rise of the right and to build alternative parties that are real alternatives. Um, not the one, I hate that they took that word. It's like Donald Trump took the word great. I hate that they took the word alternative. Anyway, um, but so I, yeah, anyway, I'll just leave it there. I, I, think, um, I think we have to scale it up. It can happen very, very quickly. We have to have a power analysis. We have to have a theory of winning. In every campaign that we run, I ask people, when I walk in, I say, okay, so what's your theory of victory? And most people go, what? <laughs> what? Like, what'd you just ask me? And I'm literally like, so what's the theory of the campaign? How are you going to win? How much power do you need? Have you pre-thought how much power you need to win this campaign? Have you done some research? Have you done a little homework? And then have you plotted a strategy uh, that's going to let you start to build long-term structures in the community and win? Like, maybe that's really the concept. It's like when we teach people to win on issues that matter to them, we're going to build stronger, bigger political parties and stronger and bigger unions. And it is sort of the same strategy. Um, and I, I believe that you are doing that, Sarah, uh, right now. And that's a good thing as far as I can hear in the Department of Strategy. Um, and I think we need to do a lot more of it, like a lot. So I think we, I think we grow and build when we help people win on issues that matter to them. And that's a key concept, like working on issues that matter to people. And we learn what those issues are by asking them. If you could change something tomorrow, what would it be? And then we begin to build organizing structures from the bottom up. And it can happen fast. It's not slow. It's the fastest way to stopping the climate crisis um, is by bottom up organizing, done systematically, done well, done with a strategy, done fast, quick, everyone out of your chairs and into the streets.